Morning everyone. Today we have another interview of Atomi per la Pace. I'm Vincenzo Romanello. Atomi per la Pace is an Italian pro-nuclear non-profit association providing information to the general public about energy and in particular nuclear energy. Today we, I am glad to introduce Dr. Uh, Harding, Margaret Harding, uh, who has uh, 32 years, uh, uh, years, uh, years experience uh, in the U.S. nuclear industry. She advises clients on quality, regulatory, technical and business issues within the industry. During Fukushima, she was a key spokesperson for the American Nuclear Society and responded to more than 400 media inquiries. She is also an adjust assistant professor at the Iowa State University. Good morning, uh, Dr. Harding. Good morning. Um, first, let me correct you. I'm actually not a doctor. I don't want anyone to think I'm inflating my resume. So I, I actually do not have a, a PhD. Oh, so. okay. Sorry. That's okay. So uh, let's come to our first question today. You were quoted as a BWR specialist uh, and interviewed by media during the Fukushima accident. In an interview, um, you stated that a good strategy for nuclear community should be to establish links with local media before a nuclear accident occurs in order to be trusted as a reliable source. However, anti-nuclear movements are very strong worldwide and it is not simple for nuclear scientists to establish themselves as reliable sources. What do you think about anti-nuclear movements in USA, and why do you think they are so deep-rooted in the public opinion? Well, interestingly, they're not actually that deeply rooted in the public opinion. The good news is in the United States, over 60% of the people actually support nuclear power. What is happening, however, is that the anti-nuclear movement is quite vocal with their uh, concerns about nuclear power. So when you watch the media, you get this impression that most of the people of the United States are anti-nuclear because they tend to report these negative stories. For example, on my own local TV station, they just reported about um, genetic mutations in Fukushima. They were showing all these funky-looking vegetables and claiming that this was radiation-induced. Um, and the broadcasters don't have a lot of knowledge, so they're easily influenced by these stories. Um, and, in fact, the woman anchor said, ooh, I wouldn't want to eat any food from Japan. Um, I immediately contacted the station and said, although I'm not an expert in this, this is incorrect. Now, in this particular case, I wasn't successful in getting them to um, put out a correction, but um, by developing a contact with that station, and, and I've had one with them over the years, um, when something happens in the local area, they do tend to call me first before they call the local anti-nuclears and or at least they ask me for my opinion before they air some of the dumber stories that get out there. I don't know why this one got past them, but um, it does help. Now, that said, part of the reason that the anti-nuclear movement is quite entrenched is that a lot of the, uh, in, in kind of a negative side of the story is back when uh, you have to kind of go back and look at the beginnings of the anti-nuclear movement in the United States. So you go back and you look at Greenpeace in its early days. You look at the Union of Concerned Scientists in its early days. You look at how Friends of Earth was created, um, which is a little different. But the first two both started as anti-nuclear weapons and okay. were um, pushing very hard on the dangers of radiation, the dangers of airborne testing and atmospheric testing, and were pushing very hard for those treaties, which were a good thing at the time. Whether or not airborne radiation was really the issue, frankly, nuclear weapons are, you know, a, a civilization breaker. So having, having these organizations campaigning hard to get international treaties that banned atmospheric testing and ultimately banned all nuclear weapons testing, I think was a good thing. We can argue that one if, you know, some people don't, but I, I happen to agree with them. However, what happened to both of these organizations, once those treaties got passed, their contributions went to nearly zero. Mm -hmm. So they were looking around for a new thing to campaign against. Well, one of their big campaign things was radiation, this scary thing you can't see or smell or taste. And ooh, and doc, back to Dr. Calabresi and linear no threshold, ooh, every little ionizing beam is dangerous. All you had to do was change the word weapon with the word power, and you were back in business. And that's exactly what happened in both organizations. So they had a lot of 
um, already had a lot of acceptance and, and I'll say footprint in the media for their work in weapons. So they picked right up and they went right on with nuclear power. Um, Friends of Earth is a little different in that it got formed because at one time, believe it or not, the Sierra Club was pro-nuclear. They would rather have seen nuclear power plants than the damming of some of the big rivers and the big um, reservoirs that those create that destroy some of the most beautiful countryside in the country. So, but, so the Friends of Earth got formed when there was a split inside the, the um, uh, Sierra Club that caused uh, the guy, David Brower, I believe his name was, who was the executive director of the Sierra Club, to leave and form his own organization called Friends of Earth, which is solely created to be anti-nuclear. Again, he had a lot of contacts because he'd had this cachet as the executive director of Friends of, Earth, of the Sierra Club, so it was easier for him to get in. What I've recommended and what I've been talking to people about is don't try to become the expert during a crisis. That's hard to do. It's hard for the um, public to, and especially the journalists to not end up with the best scenario we had during Fukushima, which was he said, she said. Um, you know, they, they, they reported both sides as though they were equally factual. The good news was is that over and over again, what I said was shown to be right. There was not a large amount of terabecrals. There was not so much radiation that it was going to kill anyone. There was not so much radiation that people were even really going to get sick, that the evacuations were being very conservative. All those things that I kept saying have turned out to be true, which gives me credibility with the journalists. So now back to my comment, where I'm really after is students and young people in the nuclear industry can develop relationships in the non-critical, non- non-crisis communications with the local journalists. Then when something happens nearby, that local journalist is going to call the guy he knows is an expert as opposed to the guy who's got expert in his resume. You still might end up with the he said, she said, but the goal is always to be the first one listed in the conversation. If you're first, your, your truthfulness by the reader is more likely to be accepted. And the second person quoted is usually considered to be the opposing opinion. Hmm. So not perfect, but a, a way to get a, a way to start to get inroads into it, because this is exactly what the anti-nuclears in this country have been doing. They've been developing relationships with reporters and with journalists all over the country over the years. And so when things started to happen, they picked up the phone and they called the guy that they had developed this relationship with. We just need to do the same thing. Yes, I, I, I agree. So this introduces the second question I wanted to make. Concerning the anti-nuclear movements, did you have a chance to watch Professor Calabres' interview that we realized about the LN, LNT fraud? And what do you think about it? Well, I think uh, Dr. Calabresi has uncovered some interesting information there. Um, I heard him speak at the American, I believe he spoke at the American Nuclear Society Conference in Chicago a year ago. Um, I, I didn't hear him. I heard another uh, presentation on that, but he, I have his papers and I've read them. Um, I, I have to say, I, I tend to agree with the concept that there has to be a threshold. Um, I just look at radiation levels around the country, background radiation, even if you ignore Ramsar uh, in, in Iran or Iraq, wherever it is. Um, Iran, because, Iran. Iraq, because it's such a small population. You can look at the, the, the beaches of Brazil and some other areas in this country that have, in this world that have very high radiation levels and no recordable increased incidence of cancer. There were also some videos about this Guarapari uh, beach with people has uh, Geiger. Right, they uh, bury themselves in the sand because it, it's warm and it feels good and they think it relieves their aching joints. It's the same thing with radon springs. So I believe that there's truth to the idea that there's a threshold. There's been some interesting studies in recent history with um, uh, that also saw presented in Chicago where they looked at ionizing radiation of breast cancer cells, which are very prone to damage from radiation. And they could see damage no matter how little radiation, but the cell correctly repaired itself until they went across a threshold. They're not sure exactly where the threshold was, but they could see that small amounts of radiation cells or our cells are designed to repair themselves. Larger amounts of radiation, maybe not so accurately. So that's, again, indication that somewhere in there is a threshold. Now that said, I got to tell you that having this argument with the public 
usually loses because it's very confusing. I got to tell you, I've, I've had the conversation and a lot of the public just, it's, it's, it's like talking about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin to them. They, it's, it's a confusing conversation. So I generally don't go after it other than to point out the varying levels of background radiation around the world and say, pretty clear to me that there's a threshold in there somewhere. We don't know exactly where it is. And linear no threshold is an extremely conservative regulation. And I take it out of the science world and talk about it in terms of regulation and say, we've got to stop treating it as science and treat it as a, as a choice in the regulation. Because they do the same thing with other harmful products like mercury and arsenic. They, they act like no matter how small the dose is, it's deadly and dangerous. But we all know that's not true. In fact, botulism, one of the most dangerous bacteria out there, is used to make women's faces look smoother. Because in tiny doses, it just causes, I've never had it done, but it just causes a little bit of, of the, its effect without hurting the rest of you. Radiation is the same way. I had a CAT scan three weeks ago. I'm still here to talk about it. Yes, of course, there are many examples. Yeah. Let's come to the other, another question. Uh, what was wrong in Fukushima accident management from technical and communication to general public points of view? What should be improved and how, in, in your opinion? Okay, well, there is a lot of things that were going on during Fukushima. Accident management, um, I think uh, I've worked with the Japanese for a number of years. I've always, during the accident, especially, wanted to be very careful not to skewer them. I mean, they were scrambling to deal with this accident. The last thing they needed was for us to um, beat on their management issues. But, in fact, there's, there's several cultural accident that, that come out into the accident management. Passing good news, bad news to your superiors is always problematic in Japan. So there was um, a lack of information flow about what was really going on up the chain. So that meant that decisions were getting made that were on wrong information. For example, Unit 1, when the ISO condensers stopped working, the person who looked at them and went, well, this doesn't seem to be working, and turned them off again, didn't tell anybody. That's why Unit 1 got in so much more trouble. There was no cooling going on when we all believed that there was cooling going on. Um, the other problem in Japan is the tendency to want consensus before a decision is made. In crisis, you have to have a single leader who makes a decision. And bless the guy who was the, the plant manager at the time who put seawater in those plants despite what his management and apparently the, the prime minister of the country wanted because he went against the orders to do that, which is very difficult in their society. And in fact, I understand that he had, a, he, he recently died of um, esophageal cancer, uh, but he actually got a reprimand in his file for not doing what he was told, even though he was then given an award for saving what he could of the plants with his seawater injection. And you, you look at that dichotomy and you say, whoa, there's a problem here that, that really exacerbated the issues uh, at the plant. Um, there was some long-term issues there, of course, with decisions made about where those generators were located. Got to say they worked for almost 40 years, but they had opportunities and missed windows in the early 2000s to put generators up the hill behind the plant um, based on information coming from the U.S. about reevaluations that had been done here on risk of generator flooding. So they missed some opportunities there. Communication, I think that the biggest error that got made both by TEPCO and by those of us out there trying to translate that complex technical jargon to the public was that we, we refused to speculate. We were very, I was very focused on this is what we know right now, which is great. The problem was is that the anti-nuclears were out there speculating way off into the plants are going to completely melt down, it's going to be Chernobyl times three, all these terrible things are going to occur. What happened to us is that every time new information came, we got a little worse and a little worse and a little worse, and it ended up looking like TEPCO and us were chasing bad news, that we were being over-optimistic, that we weren't telling the truth, that TEPCO was somehow keeping secrets. If we had said, look, worst case scenario is these reactors have melted because of the long period of time without cooling. This is what that means. We would have accurately described the situation that we see in those plants today, and our credibility would have been that much higher. 
tough road, a tough line to walk because you don't want to get too too anti, too too extreme in what could have happened. But a little more speculation would have had us ahead of the bad news instead of behind it. And that would have increased our credibility. The other problem TEPCO had was that they were very worried, I think appropriately so, about people overreacting. So they were moderating the news in some ways that they really should have been a little bit more accurate about it. One of the worst incidents was when Dr. Yasko chose to claim that Unit 4 Pool was on fire. And we had this complete communication breakdown between Japan and the U.S. about what was really going on with that pool. We know now it never, probably never even lost water um, and certainly didn't burn. Um, and the fear that was engendered in the population of Japan because the U.S. was saying one thing, the Japanese authorities were saying another, and the poor population had no idea who to trust. Just let me comment about that. Of course, we should expect, in principle, the Chernobyl, but the main difference that uh, we should uh, argue was that they were water reactors, so right. a fire, fire is impossible. So this right. we, we could say from the very beginning, but right. honestly, did you expect from the very beginning a meltdown? No, I did not. Uh, based on the information we had at the early days of this accident, we thought that they had managed to keep cooling on those plants. I did not believe that they were melted until the news came out in May or June that they finally got a water level reading and it was well below bottom of active fuel, which clearly meant that they, they were gone. Um, but uh, all, all my friends and experts at GE were adamant because we believed that they'd gotten cooling in there in time that they hadn't melted. There is still some argument about units two and three. It's clear what happened in one, correct? The, the ISO condensers were not running, which meant that there was no cooling going on whatsoever when everyone believed that there was cooling for several hours. Um, so, but units two and three, they were quicker to get the seawater in. They had, they had kludged together the battery operated pump issue. I, I thought the Japanese did a phenomenal job of coming up with solutions when they didn't have great procedures. Um, the fact that they went out and got car batteries and hooked them up and, and kept those valves working on units two and three. Units two and three may be partially melted, but I'm willing to bet that they're in much, much better shape once they finally get in there than unit one. We know unit one is just gone. Um, but two and three um, may be partially melted, but I'm pretty sure they haven't seeped through the bottom of those vessels. Well, I'll tell you what hit me mainly. Uh, what I was, I was hit mainly by the malfunctioning of recombiners. I would expect that recombinants would work and there would not be a hydrogen explosion. This is yeah, now think about me. that. Yeah, they, they most likely, if they had recombiners, which weren't required, by the way, um, they would have been operated electrically. So they didn't have power. They didn't work. Second problem there was, again, the consensus management issue. They could have vented much earlier than they did, and they were so worried about the small amount of radiation that might be released in the vent stacks that they waited and waited and waited until they got consensus from everybody that they could vent. And it was too late at that point because the pressure built up and hydrogen's a light gas. You just need the tiniest of leaky spots for it to come out. It's going to rise. The explosions occurred exactly where you would have expected them based on the hydrogen leaking probably out of the top of the containment head. And um, But, yeah, they, they if they had recombiners, which – I'm going to say again, is by no means definite. They were most likely electrically generated, electrically driven, and they had no power, so they wouldn't have worked. However, I think that at the end of the day, the nuclear technology will learn the lesson as it Absolutely. was uh, from TMI. Absolutely. It was a lesson learned at TMI, although at the time, the, one, of the, one of the concerns at TMI was actually not hydrogen in the plant, but hydrogen in the containment the containment at Fukushima was backfilled with nitrogen, so it didn't matter how much hydrogen built up in the containment, it was never going to go because there was no oxygen in there for it to play with. What happened was the leaking into the, basically into the refuel floor, um, it accumulated in the roof of the refuel floor. The reason Unit 2 didn't blow, a panel happened to get knocked out when Unit 1 blew, and the hydrogen was able to escape. So it was a really simple fix. All they needed was a vent open at the top of the building to let the hydrogens come out. 
hard decision, however. Okay, yeah. let's come to the next question. Uh, what do you think about the recent decision to restart the nuclear power plants building in USA after a pause of some decades? And uh, do you think nuclear energy can help economic and environmental issues in USA concerning the energy availability? Absolutely. Nuclear power, I'm very excited uh, about the plants getting built here. I, I thought at one point in my career that I would retire when we shut down the last plant. Um, so I'm excited that um, my son, who's working on his advanced degrees at MIT, he doesn't want to be in the nuclear industry, but he will live his life with nuclear power plants working around him. I, so I'm very excited about that. Um, I think that the AP-1000 is a great design, and it's going to work very well in the locations it is. Will it help economic and environmental issues? Absolutely. By running nuclear power plants, you can directly replace coal. Coal is, not only does it emit CO2 for climate change issues, but it is dirty. Even the cleanest of coals puts out lots of other junk. There's tons and tons of fly ash, which unlike nuclear power plants where, there, where our spent fuel, spent fuel is very contained and very small, fly ash is huge volumes. We've had fly ash ponds here in the United States break and wash communities out. Weirdly enough, it's full of uranium, right? You know that. And radon gas is released because of that. It's got thorium in it. It's got all kinds of radioactive materials in it that are actually concentrated in the fly ash because the carbon's all been burned out. If it were controlled by the NRC, they would not be allowed to leave it in these open pits. Yes, this would be very funny. And, and then I look, so you look at that, and then the other thing that drives me insane is what they do to the environment to dig the coal up. What they're doing in this country now is they're chopping the tops off the mountains to get to these narrow coal seams that they can't go underground. If, if a coal seam is only six feet deep, you can't dig it underground because it's not deep enough for the machines to get in. So what are they doing now? They're chopping the tops off the mountains, scooping all the coal up. They're basically flattening mountains. They're turning them into golf courses when they're done and trying to say it's a good thing. <laughs> Real disaster. It's a terrible thing. It's just unbelievable. So absolutely, I think nuclear power does wonderful. It, it replaces that baseload power, and that's, that's <clears> the thing that the renewable industry can't do and won't accept is – Baseload power is important, and right now that's, in this country now, 40% coal. We've got to do something different. Uh, the movie Pandora's Promise, directed by Robert Stone, has been recently released in USA. Did you have a chance to watch it? Yes, I did. What is your impression, and do you think that it will facilitate the open and honest discussion about nuclear energy and its related issues in USA? Um, I think it's a great movie. Uh, it's clearly focused at people not in the industry. Those of us that are in the industry watched it and went, yeah, okay, <laughs> we know these things. Um, I think the fact that it was put out by a person who used to be pretty strongly anti-nuclear and has five people starring in it that were also pretty strongly anti-nuclear at points in their lives um, speaks very much to a break in the environmental community. And environmentalists in this country and I think around the world have had a knee-jerk reaction that nuclear must be bad. Um, and I think the movie's push on you have to relook at this is going to take people who have, um, they have, you have to have a little bit of an open mind to start with. But you probably aren't going to go to that movie if you don't. So I do think it's engendering some good conversations with people who haven't really thought about it before, um, who are learning about some of the misconceptions of nuclear that he talks about. He talks about the fact that, in, that a lot of people don't know that 10% um, of the electricity in the United States, 50% of the nuclear electricity is generated by uranium that's been downblended from Russia from their weapons program. So if you are familiar with the, the parable of swords to plowshares, this is the biggest swords to plowshares program in the history of mankind, is taking nuclear weapons that were meant to destroy the cities in the United States and instead light them. And he talks about this in Pandora's Promise. And I think that these kinds of rethinkings about if you really care about climate change, you've got to think about nuclear. You've really got to think about it. Um, Richard Rhodes in the book talks about, or in the movie, talks about if you're against nuclear, you're for oil and gas. 
uh, or carbon because that is what's going to be used instead. And um, I think if you look internationally and you really start to think about countries that are trying to develop from um, with a India is a good example. India has not enough electricity. China is the same way. India is being held back because there's not enough electricity available to them. So what are they going to do? They can't put enough solar or wind in. So either they're going to put more coal plants in or they're going to build nuclear power plants. But without electricity, their people can't move up the chain. They're still stuck in in survival mode in villages with inadequate power with and especially the women are forced to walk miles to get water sometimes they're the ones that have to wash clothes by hand because there's not enough electricity so when you start to put electricity into these places and you lift the population it's just amazing so what are they going to do they can't get enough with solar and wind it's just not even close Nuclear is one of the only ways the world can make that difference. The problem, at least here in Europe, uh, as far as I understand, however, is that uh, media are lying and cheating because they say that uh, nuclear can be, uh, we don't need nuclear because we have the sun. And people believe really that with the sun they can produce all the energy they need. And people are really convinced of that. Yeah, if you do the math, though, if you can sit somebody down and walk them through the math, it's clear it doesn't work. And if you look at Germany you know it's not working because what's happening in Germany, and, and I've been watching Germany closely because, frankly, California is the next Germany. Um, and so what's happening in Germany, energy bend, first of all, they, they haven't abandoned nuclear. They still have a fair number of their nuclear plants running. I think 16 of them are still operating, something like that. And they, But they've increased the amount of coal they're burning. Yes, those power plants were started before they decided to shut down the nine nuclear plants. But the plan had been that they, they would burn cleaner and they would shut down some of the older coal plants. They haven't shut those older coal plants down. So they're burning far more coal than they were. Then the, the renewable market, the renewables are completely screwing up their market. Even if you're not a capitalist, the reality is that somebody's got to pay for these things. Of course. We pay so huge have, taxes for that. Right. So so their electricity is now some of the most expensive in Europe. Okay. And what happens now is the countries that surround Germany are threatening to put breakers in to stop Germany from dumping electricity on them in the wee hours of the morning when wind is at its peak and nobody needs the power. Because it's messing with the grids in Poland and, and some of the other countries around the edges of Germany. So that's not working for them. And the things I'm reading is that what the energy markets are so screwed up, there are no long-term contracts, and the short-term market is so unpredictable that nobody will work in it. So frankly, Germany's energy electricity supply is really at risk for all this stuff. And what backs up wind and solar when they don't work 90% of the time? Just, Natural gas. Just to support what you are saying, I got... Uh uh, an information from Netherlands, for example, and the electrical utility wrote to customers that they were forced to increase the price of energy for many reasons, but one of these reasons was just the phase out of German plants. It was yep. really written. So, right. But people very often do not know this. However, right. It's, it's actually an interesting, just as an aside, in a, in a conference I was at in uh, February, uh, one of the utility executives here in the United States said one of the things we've done wrong, and I think this is worldwide, well, in the um, the uh, Europe and the U.S., the, I don't know, the advanced countries, I hate to use that term, but countries that have got a lot of electricity, it's so easy, when you plug your, your computer into the wall, you expect that electricity to be there. It's 99.99% reliable, and so you disconnected from what it really takes to make sure those electrons are going to be there when you plug into that wall. And we need to educate the public. We that know how hard this is need to start doing a better job of helping the public understand what it really takes. What we are trying to do also today. So <laughs> let's come to the next question. What do you think about the non-electrical applications of nuclear energy? In particular, how do you think that high temperature gas reactors technologies can contribute to recover exhaust heat for industrial applications? What do you think about the hydrogen production with high temperature gas reactors? Do you think it could be a resource for the future where fossil fuels will become scarce and expensive? I think hydrogen 
high temperature gas is a very cool concept. I, I, I'll take you back 30 years. My in my uh, senior year of college, one of my senior projects was to quote design a reactor. Of course, it was very primitive, simple design. I picked high temperature gas. It's a very cool uh, concept in that it's simple. It's using a non-corrosive uh, coolant like gas. You can either use helium or, interestingly enough, carbon dioxide um, as the, the the coolant loop, and then you use graphite for a moderator. So nothing. There's very little moving parts involved, and and things make a lot of sense. As high temperature um, heat for industrial applications is a very interesting new space for nuclear to get into. If you look, there's a wonderful map from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs, the new one for 2012 just came out, that shows the amount of energy, let's see if I can do this right, the amount of energy moving into electricity, what, what fuels electricity and then how various energies are used in residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation here in the United States. And one of the things that's really interesting in that chart is electricity is only about 30% of our entire electrical use or entire energy use in the U.S. So when we talk about renewables and we talk about nuclear, we're almost exclusively talking about electricity. If you went 100% carbon-free electricity, you would only change the amount of carbon being emitted by about 25% in the entire country of the United States. Where another big chunk of carbon use is, is in industrial applications. So this is industrial heat for smelting. This is industrial heat, frankly, for making oil products, oil and gas, natural gas, well, not natural gas, um, gasoline for your automobiles and diesel fuel requires a huge amount of heat, so they actually burn their own fuel to make the fuel to fuel our cars. So it's a terribly carbon-intensive thing. So if you can put industrial heat in there, and the high-temperature gas reactor is a really nice solution because you don't, it's gas going in, so you don't have to use heat exchangers too much. You might want to do that for radiation purposes, but, but you can take that heat straight out into those reactors, and if you use a non-reactive gas like helium, you don't really have to do anything. You can take it straight from the reactor out to these plants and provide the heat to make that change. There's other cool things that you can do. One is, as you point out here, is make hydrogen. As we exhaust our carbon reserves, hydrogen is going to become a much more important fuel for us. Today, the way hydrogen is made, you crack methane, uh, and you make carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Hmm, maybe not such a good choice. In the future, you might start looking at electrolysis techniques and other techniques, as you described here, to, to crack water, to get your hydrogen out of water or out of other materials, as opposed to cracking methane, which is the easiest way to get it today. The other really interesting thing is to use a Fischer-Tropsch process to convert coal to gasoline. It's what the Germans did during World War II, okay, because they didn't have much To food their tanks. Right. And so it was a terribly dirty process. It, they used coal to burn, to heat the coal, to create the gasoline and the diesel. If you use nuclear power to create the diesel and the gasoline, suddenly you've made a much cleaner process, and you've taken coal and moved it from electrical down to transportation, which is not so easily converted to electrical use or other fuels. Liquid fuel is right now our best mode of transportation. This introduces also the next question. Do you think that uh, high temperature gas reactors technology will be of interest for U.S. energy policy in future, especially considering the steep increase of energy demand expected by the second half of the present century? And do you think that this technology will be exported, for example, to countries which could use the low quality exhaust heat for water desalination, for example? Absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, Saudi Arabia has expressed an interest in the, the high-temperature gas reactor. They've talked to both China and the United States about it ex expressly for desalinization as well as operating their own oil refineries. They're looking at it, and um, just in general, when you talk about uh, nuclear um, – or when you talk about Saudi Arabia, they don't want to use all of their – fuel that they're pulling out of the ground for their own population, that's their money maker. So they're wanting to get something like a nuclear plant to limit how much of it they actually have to burn locally so they can sell it out to the rest of the world. 
So absolutely see that. I see it as a big uh, potential in the U.S. energy policy for the same kinds of reasons. The U.S., we've frequently said here that we're the Saudi Arabia of coal. We have more coal in this country than any other country in the world. And um, the problem is right now we're burning it all to generate electricity. Well, if we could use it to create, to solve the transportation issue, right, now suddenly we don't need to import as much oil from other parts of the world. That's better for our own energy security in this country um, because we're not as reliant on unstable regions for fuel. So, yes, I think it's a, a key part of energy policy if we actually had an energy policy. Just to support you, just recall to our viewers that, for example, uh, United Emirates, um, Emirates are building a couple of plants. They started yeah. building a couple of plants uh, last year. Yeah, and they're very serious about it, As it, and Saudi Arabia, Turkey's building a couple. Uh, and, and you look at these countries and you say, well, why would they do that? They've got all this sun. Well, they've looked, and they've concluded that as nice as the sun is, uh, it's not reliable enough for them. One of the features of high-temperature reactors is the very low power density with respect to light water reactors. Do you think, considering also the experiments that were done in the German AVR reactor during the 80s, that this would prevent the occurrence of accidents like the Fukushima one? Absolutely. Uh, the high-temperature gas reactor has been shown to be um, meltdown proof. You can, you can shut that puppy down. You can just literally turn everything off, and, and it is self-regulating. It, it heats up and then it cools right back down. And the fuel is designed to tolerate very high heats because you want those high temperatures coming out. That's the whole purpose, right? So it, it has been proven. I think some of the AVR reactor experiments in Germany, and I think there were some done in China as well, where they literally shut everything off and walked away, and it shut itself down perfectly safely. We have to say also that there are a couple of experimental plants, uh, in, one in China, HTR and HTTR in Japan. Yep. And yep. in Japan, yep. they also tried the, the hydrogen production for 40 hour, 40, 44, 48 hours, I think, continuously. Yep. Yeah, it's very doable. It's, it's all a matter of what do you want them to do. I think, think one of the things that we sometimes suffer with in the design side of the nuclear world is that we want our reactors to do everything. And what, what, what is much smarter is just like any technology is designed for the specific use you have in mind. And then you may have a different kind of reactor or a different basis for the reactor to do something else. So you might take a high temperature gas and decide you're going to use it to crack hydrogen. You might take another one and you're going to use it for a Fisher trope. And, you, and there would be subtle differences in the, not necessarily the reactor itself, but in all the accompanying hardware. So we, we always have to remember that when we're working on these things. Let's come to our last question. Another feature of this kind of reactors is the very good neutron economy, which allows, in principle, to burn efficiently plutonium and to exploit thorium resources. What do you think about that? What do you think about the U.S. policy to consider plutonium as a waste and not as a fuel resource? The U.S. policy on plutonium drives me nuts, um, to be quite blunt. It is unreasonable not to consider this wonderful fuel source. Frankly, from a, if you're worried about proliferation, which is always the argument, what's the best way to kill the proliferation risk of plutonium than to put it in a reactor and burn it? You generate electricity, and you no longer have plutonium. Now, you generate more plutonium out of the uranium, but put it back in and burn it again. This, it, we call it spent fuel, and it's really um, more like a used car. You can use it again. You do need to clean it up. You need to take out the stuff that's not so good in there that's blocking, essentially, the usefulness, and you can use it again. High-temperature gas is, is a somewhat, I'll say, uh, fuel neutral. You can run it on plutonium. You can run it on uranium. You can run it on thorium. You don't really care. Um, and as such, I like the design for that very purpose. It is... Um, Right now, they're working mostly towards the uranium fuel cycle because it's the infrastructure we have here in this country. But there's no reason you couldn't burn plutonium in it. Um, I personally think that some of this is better. Let's look at the next design out there and think about that in a specific new product. But, hey, we can burn it in the high-temperature gas as well. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you.